it is halfway through the year, which means I owe you a reading update. Now, I have been a busy beaver this year. I have been reading away. You might have seen that I read the whole of the Women's Prize long list, apart from the one book I DNF'd that ended up winning. <laughs> and I'm excited to halve your book buying anxiety by telling you some of the best books I've read this year so far so far. It'll be really interesting to see at the end of the year how many of these books make it to my final top 10. But because the competition for those slots is so fierce, sometimes it's sad at the end of the year when I have to cut books that would have been in my mid-year wrap-up and are probably good enough to make the top 10, but have just missed it by a little hair winkle, a sliver, a sniff. So if you're worried to pick up a book because you don't know if you're going to be disappointed or you think the blurb is lying to you, let me just tell you, I've got some crackers for you here today. And first up, <laughs> I make no apologies, and this isn't an ironic recommendation, Spare by Prince Harry. I will not be taking questions from the audience. Uh, I have no notes for our almost overlord turned slightly more radical than anybody else in his bloodline. If you would like to watch my 40 minute breakdown of why I genuinely think this is one of the best books of the year and why it will also make waves in the public psyche as to how we think about power and monarchy, um, that video is up there. <laughs> You can watch it if you want. So far, I'm keeping the boundary in that if you haven't read this book, I am not gonna have a conversation with you about it because it would be a pointless conversation. Next up is another unexpected entry. Lessons in Chemistry is a book that I read and I read only because I was in a local book club. I say was, I'm still in a local book club and they picked it and I was like, oh, I've seen it everywhere. I'm not like other readers. This has been in supermarkets. It can't be actually good. Well, hunker me humbled, sizzle be surprised. This is actually a genuinely a really amazing book. I would say it's like Hidden Figures meets Julie and Julia. Tragic yet exceptionally cozy for some strange reason, even though loads of horrific things happen. It follows a woman called Elizabeth Zott, who works in a research facility as a scientist in the 1960s, and for loads of incredibly horrific and sexist reasons, she's unable to keep working there, and she ends up starting a chemistry-based cooking show that is accidentally incredibly radical. I finished this book, I had a little cry, I thought it was really good, but I thought, oh, I'm probably not going to reread it. I might give it away. So I put it on my pile of books to give away. And I recently went back and unearthed it because it had more of an effect on me than I'd realised when I'd first finished it. Has that ever happened to you? And you're like, okay, that was a good book, but like, I can let it go. And then you, a few months later, you're like, I can't let it go. Sucker punched. Like everyone, it, it turns out the girlies were right. This is a genuinely very well written, very well paced, slightly sensational, but incredibly fun book. And also Brie Larson is going to be the adaptation that's going like in a TV show. Oh, it's going to be so good. When it comes to women's prize books that I've included on this personal list, I'm not going from the same standpoint as I was at my video where I ranked all the women's prize long list books. In that video, I'm genuinely thinking about what is formally the best book written, has the most impact, and I can genuinely look at it and be like, that is a well-crafted book. The books that made it to this list, vibes only. They're the ones that stayed personally with me through no like objective merit they have over other books that also are in my top list in that video, but just genuinely because I feel like a personal affection for them and I remember that they hit me the hardest. So the one of the books that has made this list now on reflection after months after I've read them is Black Butterflies by Priscilla Morris. This follows a woman in her late 50s, who is an art teacher and a landscape painter during the siege of Sarajevo in the 90s. It's about trying to live your life and find beauty while also accidentally becoming a boiled frog in a pot of political stuff that's happening around you. Priscilla is of Yugoslavian and Cornish parentage, uh, and this is based on a lot of interviews and experiences of family members that she knows. It has a heavy emphasis on facing pessimism and the value of art. And if you also like a story where there's like a collection of characters that are unlikely and then form a little community in an unexpected way, then this is definitely a book for you. I thought it was absolutely brilliant. The other books that transferred from my best books on the Women's Prize to this list were 
Glory by No Violet Bulawayo. If you go into it expecting a genuinely important and unique piece of political literature that's also very funny and very, very readable, then you'll be really happy. If you go into it thinking this is Animal Farm set in Zimbabwe, you're going to be disappointed because it's not that and I think that it's been sold that way and that I can understand why it's had negative reviews if that's what you're going into it expecting. But I think this book is going to be remembered because it's, it's incredibly weird and unique and it says so much it really encompasses a lot of different very complex human emotions about generational trauma inherited abuse and how fragile our collective memory is and th that said that makes it sound like a like a drudge of a read it's so not it's so pacey like I said, it is genuinely, weirdly, very, very funny. And I think she's just like an incredible talent. I can't believe this book is yes. I can't believe a human sat down and penned this book alone. Like, how is that? Humans are brilliant. You knew it was coming, pod. <laughs> this is genuinely probably gonna be maybe my best book of the year. I mean, I'm I'm calling it early, but there's gonna there's gonna be it's gonna be hard to top this. This is the book that I thought I'd hate the most <laughs> when I unboxed the women's prize books, because it looks like well, I've talked about it in my bashing book covers video, but it doesn't look good. <laughs> it is, in fact, the best book you'll ever read. Yes, it's about dolphins. No, it's not a YA coming of age story anthropomorphizing animals like they're in a Disney film. Actually, it's more like War and Peace, but under the ocean. And I'm rereading it. I, I said it. I'm rereading it already. So, Bandit Queens was robbed because it didn't make the shortlist and it didn't win. This deserves to win so many prizes. It's one of the funniest and most heartfelt and well-crafted books I've read this year. It follows Geeta, who lives in a rural Indian village, and when her husband leaves her and disappears, everybody thinks that she murdered him, and she kind of goes along with it for a while because she thinks it will be safer to live alone as a woman that way if everybody thinks she's, like, dangerous. But then loads of the other women in the village start asking her advice on how to murder their husbands and get away with it, and, it like, hilarity tragedy ensues. Yes, I'm making hilarity tragedy a double-barreled word, we're, bu we're binding those two words together for this book. It has a really dark, dark sense of humour, especially when it laughs at this idea of sisterhood and connection in this more like inherently frivolous, all women are friends, solidarity kind of way, and takes a real biting and clever look at those bonds and, and what they actually mean and how they're actually formed. And I just thought it was absolutely brilliant. I will be reading it again. Next up is the second <laughs> and only other man to make it to this list. And the other man had a ghostwriter. So props to you, Alan Rode. You wrote a book called The Eagle and the Cockerel. I read it because I was actually, one of my other like jobs, one of my other streams of income is that I chair events for bookish occasions. And I was asked to interview Alan Rode on the launch of his book. I honestly did not know what to expect when I was going into it, but I thought the premise was really fun. And it also involves a vlogger. So I was like, I have to. This is a, get ready, satirical Brexit thriller following a former mayor of Paris who wants to combine France and Germany into one country called Chalamet and help it leave the EU for good. The only person that can stop him is the other main character, an Italian political vlogger called Miss Cliché, who has a news empire based on social media and is trying to bring back a fact-checked approach to the news in an era of post-truth. This is set in the future when Brexit is kind of a distant memory. Not, not everybody who works at the news outlet remembers Brexit, like, firsthand. And it is such a freaking ride. I think it really shows that Alan has worked and researched a lot about the future of AI, blockchain, how voting works. Alan is also Italian and has lived in the UK during Brexit. And I think that this is the light relief with a serious eye on looking at ourselves that we all didn't know we needed post Brexit as British people. So if you're looking to pick up something that's fast paced and witty and slightly political, or you're buying a gift for somebody who might like something like that, somebody who maybe, maybe only reads non-fiction and is really into politics, I think this would be a perfect present for somebody who is really hard to buy for. And um, this is genuinely really unexpected. I didn't go into it thinking this is gonna be in my top 10 books of the year so far, but here we are. I'm apparently never right about the books that I think I'm going to like. I don't want this book to be 
topical, but it is now. I read it before Titanic Submarine Gate, uh, but Juliet Armfield wrote this book called Our Wives Under the Sea. It's about a woman whose wife is a marine biologist and she goes down on a research mission to the bottom of the ocean in a submarine and it gets stuck. In this scenario, they do have enough oxygen and they have enough food and they stay down there for, I think it is, months with no contact. The wife thinks that she's dead. And this book starts when she has resurfaced, when she's recovering from that experience. Her wife is recovering from thinking that her wife was dead, but was not. And it's about the ethereal and sinister experience of being under the ocean for that long and what it does to your brain and the kind of uncanny events that follow. Really haunting, really, really well written, like, oh. and um, I read this because one of my bookseller friends made me, and I'm just gonna plan to be a simp <laughs> to booksellers' recommendations from now on, because what do I think I'm doing? <laughs> Picking my own reads. Oh my god, I was wrong, there is another man on the list. Incomparable World by S.I. Martin. Oh, I'm so glad I read this. I think this was so freaking good and I haven't had a video to insert it into yet as an excuse to talk about it. I listened to this in audio. I heard about this book because I went to an online panel during one of the lockdowns about racial diversity on TV and specifically Bridgerton and why it was good but also like not good. And one of the points that this author made who was on the panel was that if you'd like to make period appropriate historical dramas about black experiences in Britain. There is like a wealth of really interesting and true stories that aren't being commissioned for TV. And he's written some books about it. So I was like, obviously I'm going to look those up. This book is set in 1780s London, just after the American Revolution. And it follows three former slaves who met in the military and are now living in London because that's what a lot of people who were fleeing the US at that time did. You basically follow them as they interact with each other, live their daily lives, try and avoid all of the trouble on London streets and even fall in love. It's really gripping really pacey, talks a lot about male friendship and the pressures that are put on it by toxic masculinity and society and poverty and the dynamics of whatever the fuck was going on in Britain at that time, which honestly sounds wild, but so much of it is based on historical facts and I learned so much, whilst also just having a really immersive, engaging, like thrilling reading experience. I just thought it was a bloody masterpiece and this book isn't talked about enough. Why don't, why have I only heard about this book from this one random panel? Bernadine Evaristo writes the introduction and she's a big fan of his writing. And I think that if you miss out on this book, you're only playing yourself. And then finally, another unexpected top 10. Maybe that's the common theme here is all the books that I thought I would be like, oh, I'm not sure, have actually turned into my favorites. This is Friendaholic by Elizabeth Day, Confessions of a Friendship Addict. I saw this book everywhere. Um, I did the whole everybody's telling me to do it so I won't do it thing and I ignored it and I didn't read it. I haven't read any of Elizabeth Day's other books but I have occasionally listened to her podcast. I was worried that this book was gonna come across quite posh. <laughs> And um, it, it did in some ways, but it was also includes like a lot of other different voices. And I think that she is very self-aware that her life is like a little bit different to like maybe most people's in the UK. I ended up borrowing the audiobook from my library app because I didn't want to like chance any money on whether I'd like it or not. And I ended up absolutely feeling it in my guts. The first few chapters I wasn't sure. And then actually I was like, I feel called out. <laughs> is this woman in my head? We genuinely don't have time to go into lots of it, but if you've got any kind of friction, like emotional chafing or pain around the following subjects, ghosting within a friendship, frenemies, when like friends aren't the best for you, but they're nice to you, but they might not be actually good for you. Friendship contracts and creating clarity within a relationship. Problems with fertility or the choice to not have children when all of your friends do. Diversity within friendship groups, acknowledgement of privilege between the dynamic of a best friend. These aren't things that I've ever read proper essays on before. And I think for that reason alone, it deserves a spot on your to read list. And also because I I feel like there are lots, well, there are some books on making friends and being lonely and struggling to make friends. There aren't very many books on people who are kind of naturally very extroverted, spread themselves incredibly thinly because they want to be friends with everybody, are slight people pleasers, and also are quite bad at differentiating people they actually have very unique connections with and people they like just have some fun with. It's me, it's, I'm the problem. <laughs> I think that there's a default to think that people who are extroverts are naturally very good friends. And I actually think that some of the these traits that we're talking about have actually made me quite a bad 
friend in the past and also unable to cut off friendships that genuinely weren't good for me. So I, I think this book is very, very interesting, very, very nuanced and full of care. I think the concept of boundaries has really been perverted online recently to a point where it's more about like, don't care about other people. That's fine. That's self-care. And I think that, that this is a great anecdote to that. It's obviously not a perfect book, but I do think it's unusual in its scope and beautifully written because Elizabeth Days is like, she's a really talented writer. So obviously I had to go out and buy the hardback because I need to go through it again and underline every passage that made me go, oh, so yeah, call me a convert. What books have you been reading lately? I want to know. Leave them in the comments below because half of the fun of reading books is talking about them. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you'd like to watch other videos similar, here are some of them. This video is made possible by the Gumption Club who tip me per video to make sure these videos keep happening. And in exchange, I add them to a secret Facebook group and also give them a secret podcast every week where I chat about the books that I'm reading and we chat together about life in general, having more gumption and calming our climate anxiety. Here's to an excellent second half of the reading year. Frog Snog out.